Yes, it was. It was a chess center for all of the services. Colonel John Groh was the uh, chess surgeon at that time. They were doing procedures that no one ever heard of before. I mean, right. this is wartime, everything else. I'm going in and taking parts, r r working around the heart and everything else on it. Right. I mean, this be war injury or... or, or they didn't, they, they didn't know. Whatever it was, he was wondering under a great big shield of protection because he was in the Army. Uh -huh. And uh, his surgery came out great. Oh. And he became quite famous for it in regard to it, which is fine. Mm. Which is fine. And was he, say, working on people with, with TB or cancers, chronic diseases, removing or? They would, they, would, they, would, they would work on anything that they could work on. Right. And because they, they were getting people from all over the world, mm. you suddenly had tropical diseases appearing out of nowhere, everything else like that. And uh, it became like a bazaar of pathology, everything that was there. Oh, yeah. Very, very interesting. I, I was assigned to this one ward, and it was called a minimal tuberculosis ward, mm. primarily consisting of idiopathic primary pleural effusions and other undiagnosed conditions related to the chest. Right. What we did, we'd follow them, take x-rays, everything else like that. Because I was under, under the impression, and it was pretty much a feeling that day, is that TB could have its beginning as a pleural lesion. Mm. Because it, it would come essentially to the lung and then essentially get up someplace in regard to the pleural and stay there and it would act like a foreign body and right. trigger a great deal of amount of fluid response. Right. So it was called pleural infusion. Uh -huh. And I was going along with the concepts of that day is that, well, they should be treated like their tuberculosis. At that time, how'd you treat people with tuberculosis? Bed rest, that was it. Number one thing. Also during this time, a very important drug came out known as streptomycin. Oh. And since this was a army hospital and military people, they, they, uh, whoever was dispensing the drug said, this would be the perfect place to, to try out and see how streptomycin is. Mm. Uh, streptomycin was a new drug in regard to antibiotics, brand new, mm. very powerful. They had selected cases who had far advanced cavitary disease. Mm. And after six months of therapy, you know what happened to the lesions? Nothing. Because, mm. Yeah, it, it can't shrink a cavity, which is there for some time. It, okay, the cavity is fibrous tissue. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's there. And the fact that there was. Uh, some lung tissue left around it wasn't too uh, too unremarkable. Mm. In fact, it brought me up to this one particular case I was particularly interested in. There's this young man who had been on the march of Bataan, and it was a good one. Mm. He was a prisoner of war. He was in General Wayne Wright's army right. for three years. And they had this death march to keep on going and everything else on it. A lot of his friends just didn't make it. They'd drop off. Mm. So. A tough guy then. Yeah. Mm. Then the time for his discharge, he takes it. He gets back to the States. Somebody says, we better get a chest x-ray. I'll get a chest x-ray. Uh, My God, he's got a great big cavity. We've got to send him to Fitzsimmons. Okay, there he comes to Fitzsimmons. Then we got him to Fitzsimmons, put him on our floor. He said, first of all, we've got to find out what his first chest x-ray what, what, what he went in four years ago. We finally got it. It had unchanged in four years. The same cavities were there with no change in it regard. I found that to be one of the most remarkable phenomena in regard to tissue response to the acid-fast bacilli, as you can imagine. 
no mm -hmm. change. Here's the person who you know had gone through living hell with the March of Bataan. His antibodies must have been knocked out and everything else with regard to it. But here he has, he has the same lesion as he had before. How did he feel? He felt fine. Wow. <laughs> he felt fine before, yeah, he does too, so. And this is with relatively large evidence of disease. Oh large. yeah, yeah, that was, it's, it's big cavitary disease. Yeah. Big cavity disease, something else like that. And it just stayed kind of almost, it just stable or remission for all that period when he was under immense pressure, when you would expect it would take him out or expand. Well, yeah. I got in a discussion with uh, Dr. Waring, who was the mm. chief of medicine at Colorado, University of Colorado, I says, look, we're not doing any good with these people with far advanced disease. Why don't we hit the people with the earliest disease? Mm. He, said, he said, I may like it, you may like it, but the government says no. <laughs> so we didn't do it. Th that to me was very logical. Uh, if you got one that's a very early disease and you hit it and you'd had a response, you'd be wow, whoopee. You, you, you got mm. a jackpot there. Oh yeah, catch it early. In the, sa in the sense like catching cancer early, the outlook was a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. And the earlier, so that guy stayed basically with no progression over all those years. Now I have heard talk of people who were in prison or war camps by being effectively very fasted, that the fasted state can be good for immune function, ironically. Um, I wonder are some of those phenomena possibly happening, or is he a one-off, unusual case? Um. There's so much we don't know mm. about physiologic response. Mm. There's a lot of individual response mechanisms, the inner drive of the person, mm. and their determination to lick something. Yeah. I think that's a very important key in regard to it. We've seen others who just quit. They're gone. Yeah, uh, you, you, you quit fi fighting, the disease takes over. That's right. about it. So that connection between the will and the psychological effect and your physiology is yeah. extra. Yeah. They, they're yeah. still searching for that to fully yeah. understand it. Yeah. Mm. And the earlier people where the streptomycin didn't really change the lesions. Yeah, but in general, though, my, my understanding of the old days of antibiotics was TB was a dreadful disease, but when the antibiotics came in, they were, they were remarkably effective, and that ended the era of TB. So these people where the streptomycin didn't really seem to have a major effect, but in general, didn't the antibiotics have a, have a really big effect on TB to eradicate it in the broad way? It wasn't totally eradicated, mm. but it could be contained. Okay. However, one of the side effects that was very remarkable and not known essentially at that time, that streptomycin had a toxic effect on the eighth nerve. Mm. The eighth nerve is the one, the cranial nerves is extremely important. It's for hearing and balance. Right. What it'll do, it seemed to attract the sections in regard to balance. Mm. So, so we had these people, some of them were on streptomycin. They shut the lights off, they couldn't navigate at all. They, we had to put a cord from their bed to the laboratory so we could get back and forth in regard to it. Oh, they were losing balance. On yeah, the, that's uh, right. It, it goes out, it's out. Wow. So, so th that, that was something extremely important to know. And is streptomycin sounds familiar to me even in the modern age, so I guess it's still a drug in recent decades that's been used. Yeah. Possibly at lower doses maybe, but... It's still a powerful drug. Yeah, so they, they might have found ways to change the formulation to attenuate that problem, maybe since that period. Could be. Yeah, it could be. But they were the early days of antibiotics, I think. I mean, that, this is around... One, one of the two. very, very early ones. Uh, one yeah. of the very, very early ones. Because yeah. prior to that, no one even thought that you would be able to treat tuberculosis with a drug. It was... Uh, it's impossible. But you know, it's an asophasmosis. Yeah, I know it. 
Yeah. Don't you know they have to be up in the mountains or at rest? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the mountains. You <laughs> mentioned that earlier. There, there was actual evidence at the time, though maybe not proof, that elevated altitudes did help in some manner. Yes, it did. Mm. Yes, it did. That was why th there were successful sanitariums in upstate New York in the elevated areas. Mm. That's why Denver became a focus of uh, community hospitals, essentially for Jewish people, because they had the most interest in it. So they had their own hospital, uh, and there was National Jewish Hospital. They were treating primarily the people like this. And because Denver <clears throat> is one mile high city, yeah, 5,280 feet, bingo. No. That was it. It was good, good experience. Now, did they generally, as w in parallel to bringing them to the high altitudes, there was a general thing with TB to give sun exposure. I mean, that was part of the, the kind of to help with TB way back in the, er in the er early century. Would they, would they tend to also get them out in fresh air, sun exposure as well, or they felt it was really just the altitude? That was helpful. Mm. I really don't know. I don't think they knew either. No. The, the fact is that when people were there, mm. it, it was part of the tradition. If you got tuberculosis, you went up it's into a sanatorium at high altitude. Right. And then a certain number of them would just stay there and eventually they'd bury them. Oh. And, and others would get along fine. Mm. So that was it. So the progression would be slowed a lot and they'd, they'd get a long period. Yes, indeed. I, I find I, I, it's interesting but the, to think of confounding because I know there have been theories um, with other diseases that the higher areas in America, there's lower rates of, of multiple diseases. And one of the theories is uh, because of higher vitamin D, higher UV flux, there's much more vitamin D created in the skin which contributes to immune function. So I, it's just interesting when you say that, that the highlands, um, there is a suggestion of lower rates of disease because of more exposure to UV, much more UV when you're at higher altitudes. And then I remembered that the sun, there were solariums for TB. Uh, so it's just interesting, the altitude, what was the effect? Possibly UV exposure being much more intense could have been part of it, but we'll never know. <laughs> interesting. The, the thing is that it worked. It did actually work without knowing the full mechanism, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They were happy not to know the mechanism mm. because people were, to the Jewish hospitals, they were, had the collection of people coming from all over the world that they had tuberculosis. To those high areas. Of yeah, those yeah. So a lot of them got very well in regard to it. Right, a lot of success. Yeah. Now, now, National Jewish Hospital, uh, soon had to evolve out of that because they realized they couldn't keep their structure going just treating a disease which no one could treat anyway. And uh, so they branched out into pediatric diseases, general diseases and everything else. Mm. The features of immunology were just beginning. They established good, good biochemists and bacteriologists and they were working in that area. They become very prominent and famous for the early testing of people with their uh, vague diseases, mm. and it, it was working. So that was enough for them to get good financial support uh -huh. for, from different industries who were happy to do it. So they had good diagnostics, they could identify those things, yeah. otherwise wouldn't be. Yeah. And did the, the antibiotics then, of course, got developed and tuned and advanced, and I suppose that's what eventually curbed TB completely, it was just better and better antibiotics, and eventually... I don't think so, mm. because the entity is still here. It's Coming back uh, to somewhat. It, it's dormant. Yeah. It's dormant. And so much of it exists in the third world. Yeah. And those people come in and <coughs> they go, uh, they, they may have mutated some of their bacteria so that it's stronger than they ever thought it could be.
mm. but they haven't licked it because mm. the back to the bacilli of acid fast bacilli are so powerful. They've got this great big plastic shield around it. Oh, yeah. I mean, doom. You can just sit there and go, bye. <laughs> it's about what it was. Oh, yeah. So, so you, could, you could go into remission maybe with some assistance from the antibiotics, but it's hard to completely yeah. kill the bacteria. Yeah. And there was, I think you mentioned, a psychiatrist or, or you mentioned Roosevelt as well around having that similar bacteria but in the marrow. Yeah. Yes, that was that was the, uh, the the wife of of the president Franklin Roosevelt, uh, whose family name was also Roosevelt. Mm. She was a very strong-willed person, and she let the world know it. Oh, right. Yeah, and she would travel around and everything else on it. Very powerful person, big tall figure. Towards the end of her career, her life actually, mm. she was actually running out of gas. Didn't have the energy anymore. Right. Yeah. They put her in the bed, tried treating her, they couldn't find anything to amount to anything. And eventually she just passed away. When they did the autopsy, they found the marrow was packed packed with acid fast bacilli. I imagine that. Or marrow particularly, rather than lung or... They, that was all the report that I got from the pathologist. That, that, was, what they, that was what they found. So wow. that it would indicate a lot of her systemic symptoms and everything else. On her right. Yeah. You know, there's so much we don't know about simple things. You're encountering this every day, I know you are. 